So let me move on to these other ones and just spend a, a couple of slides on, on each of them. The second one is this notion of making results available because the public funded the research, therefore the public should have access to the products of the research. That's certainly the <coughs> argument that's behind, uh, behind, PubMed, uh, behind PubMed Central, that uh, you get the funding and you want to capture the publication at the beginning of the stream. And so the intellectual property gets captured, and to get a grant from the NIH means you have to contribute the paper within 12 months. There's a question, though, of whether the public is willing to pay for the data curation. Because the curation is not built into the funding model right now. You're going to have to invest yet more money or else raise the cost of all research if you are going to say that the public should be paying for data repositories and data reusability. And that, that's a question that wasn't really addressed in this big White House uh, promotion the week before last that many of you probably probably saw. The third one is uh, to enable others to ask new questions of data that already exist. And again, that makes sense, and that's one that's part Chris Anderson model, the cover of Wired magazine in 2008, saying that now that we have data, we no longer need theory, and we no longer need the scientific method. All we need to do is just go out and mine those data. It's, I mean, it's incredibly naive, but it also is it's sort of the thing you don't want your congressperson to, to be hearing, is that we don't need to do any more research because the data's out there, we can just go and keep mining it. Where in fact, the hard part is asking the right questions. Even people who are big data miners will, will tell you that. There was a very interesting presentation at AAAS, the American Association of Advancement of Science, in February in Vancouver from a Stanford medical professor who does what he calls dry lab science. He, he mines these massive genomics databases to come up with questions of things where he thinks are, are good targets and then he commissions rat studies to test them. And he actually outsources all of it except the asking of questions. But it still comes back to that good question that needs to be asked. The last one is uh, to advance the state of the art of research and of innovation. And this one is the other that is, is uh, actually the, the, most, the most promising, really. It's the motto of, of the Data Conservancy. Should you be curating data in ways that you can add value to those data? That, that's what we really should be doing. So NASA invests in the big space mission. Those data go into repositories. They go into things like the virtual observatory and the space science. They go into the um, infrared analysis center up at Caltech. Uh, they go into a, a mass number of other repositories. Then we get nice spectra and images that other people can use. Then those various streams can go into things like the Worldwide Telescope. How many people have used the Worldwide Telescope? Nobody. Very cool stuff. This is a free product. Uh, it's all web accessible from Microsoft. And you can. it has the NASA data and various other data streams behind it. And not only can you use this beautiful viewer to bring your data into it, you can take a photograph of the night sky on your little pocket camera, throw it in here, and it will register using astrometry.net. It'll register it in the night sky, and then you can say, oh, let me see it in optical. Let me see the infrared. Let me see the x-ray. And you can move through and, and, and do layers on top of it. You can also put uh, tours on it. And everyone from six-year-olds to very famous astronomers have put tours through the night sky. It's a great educational tool, and it, run, it runs on a web browser, and if you're in uh, Windows, it'll run more native and um, run a Silverlight as well. So I, I commend that to you. This one is more science-driven. 
where we should think about not only the, the, the big data fields that have some of their own repositories, but the long tail, the kinds of things that a number of us are, are particularly interested in. And it's that long tail of science, that long tail of data that the universities are most likely to be taking on, the data that have no home. And those are the ones we need to find ways to make useful. And if we can curate those in ways that people will make sense of them again, I think we can make some contributions there. So that brings us back to, to those rationales. And uh, this is the, the model that I put into this, uh, this JSIS paper on the conundrum of, uh, of sharing research data. And I've got the public versus research driven as the vertical and the data producers uh, or, and the users on the horizontal. So let's just walk through these briefly and think about sort of whose incentives and who will benefit about uh, different kinds of data sharing. The notion of reproducing and verifying research, I've got that one up at the top because it's very much a, it's a science driven, it's a research driven argument. And it's one that I've spread fairly far across. It should benefit the producers of data. You would think that it would be a good verification if your data are shown to be replicable. You can get some kind of a certification. The computational science community is, is doing some things around giving you a, some gold stars if you make your data replicable. But it should also protect the public by being able to say, judge, are these, are these valuable data? Another announcement that was made at AAAS in uh, some of the genomics data was people who were starting to label it by gold, silver, and bronze quality of data, and based on some measures they could get within the field. And uh, you would, if you get gold data, you can put that on your resume. And bronze data, nobody else is going to, uh, to be mining. They're going to be ignoring the bronze stuff, and heaven forbid anything below the bronze quality of data. Uh, number two, serve the public interest. This is more your, your notion coming from the, the PubMed Central and also from the, the Federal uh, Works Public Act, the FRPA. It's not quite right. Uh, so the, the Anti-Research work, Works Act, where Elsevier and others are trying to shut down the, the open access models. It's certainly very public driven, but it's phrased entirely in terms of the users of data. It's not something that really is going to engage scholars in making their data available. The third one of asking new questions, this is your, your big data, we've got all this cool stuff, everybody wants to use it. That again is phrased in terms of users of those data and not producers. People are concerned about releasing their data to others who will not give them credit for it, who will not give them attribution, and also who might misuse it and misrepresent them. There's a particular problem in the climate community where people are concerned with data being taken out of context and, and, used, in, uh, and used in other ways. The fourth one on advancing research, I've kept it above the line. It's something that is more science oriented and uh, more broadly cut. This is where the real adding value comes in. I think this is where librarians, archivists, and uh, university research offices are going to be more data or adding more value to the data. So this really is, is the conundrum. If, if we're going to leverage those data, if we're going to, if big data really is going to be valuable, we need to have the people who produce those data see that it's in their best interest to release them, which very, relatively few people do at the moment. They're going to have to be interpretable, which means other people can make sense out of them, which also means they're going to, have to be better documented than they are now. And lastly, reusable, which may mean they need to get access to the actual code used to produce those. They may need, need, need to be able to get back to the machine you will take away that data are not a black box. It's a black box that needs to be opened, needs to be interpreted. This is a running conversation that Lev Manovich and I have been having about, you know, he, he would prefer to keep the data in a black box and to make beautiful pictures out of them where my goal as a social scientist is to open up that black box 
and to try to figure out what those data are, what they mean, what context you need to make sense of them, who uses them, what's considered a use, and so on. And I don't think we're going to get too far in building that infrastructure until we start to open up that, that black box more. So these are some of the things that I think are key to a data infrastructure as part of a larger knowledge infrastructure, things that we're building. We need ways to develop those data management plans, but those plans need to mean something. And at the moment, most scholars haven't thought very much about those. And uh, give it to the library is not a data management plan. Um, or give it to the archive, and that's what a lot of librarians are, are very concerned about, is, uh, is who's going to take them and, and where are they going to go. Data standards and metadata standards, some fields have them, um, most of them don't. Again, working in environmental sciences, we, you know, we're working with our groups and saying, okay, so here's the environmental markup language. It's got all the fields that will work for your data. Would you like to adapt this? We'll help you. And so, okay, fine, let us see the manual. As soon as they looked at the 200-page manual for the environmental markup language, that was end of conversation, absolute showstopper. So we went to the merging of the water quality at the, at the San Diego Supercomputer Center and said, okay, we just want the different data elements just for nitrates. Showstopper again. You know, it's getting things in an infrastructure that match the way that people do the work. Getting the ontologies is, is a real challenge. The data deposit, there's no good place to put most of these data. The dataverse, which is a model that Harvard has been building for some time, I think is, a, is the most promising one I've seen so far. You can put the dataverse up on your own website. It looks like it can be branded out however you want it. But behind it is a centralized repository that is curated by librarians. I was at Harvard last week for the launch of the astronomy dataverse. And they had somewhere between 60 and 75 astronomy faculty show up from the Center for Astrophysics because they really were interested in a way to manage, uh, manage these data. And they had at the table the Harvard Library, as well as the faculty and the people running uh, Dataverse from the Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences. And when the library says, we are making a long-term commitment, put your data in the Dataverse, we will make sure it's there when you want to come back and, and use it later. You can have it open, you can have it closed, you can have it just for your collaborators, you can stream it to the world, you can do all kinds of things with it. So I think we're, we're getting some progress. At uh, UCLA, we're working on data registries. It's easier to get people to register their data than it is to deposit them. There's a whole movement on data citation, dealing with some of the granularity issues, and some standards. There's handles, there's digital object identifiers, easy IDs, and so on. Uh, protection, human subjects data, you don't want to just kind of drop on out there. You've got to deal with all the de-identification, the HIPAA data questions. Discoverability, we do not have good search tools yet for most kinds of data. And then the ownership and licensing, the kinds of things that uh, John Wilbanks is concerned about and, and we talk about quite a bit. So conclusions. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to Melbourne, Australia, this is an absolutely wonderful sculpture in front of the National Library, and you can think about whether the library is rising up out of the ground or sinking down, or sinking down into it. It's, it's a nice metaphor. Uh, but let me go back through and say, I think we've got at least these four rationales for sharing data. They are implicit. They are not documented explicitly anywhere. And uh, I've walked you through those uh, somewhat briefly and explored them in, in great depth with about 200 uh, bibliographic references in, in that paper if you want to follow up more. The incentives to share are also implicit. They are not very explicit, and in only a few fields do people have this native sense of, yes, I've got to get it out there. Data itself is a complex construct. Data are in the eyes of the beholder. And uh, lastly, creativity and collaboration are going to depend upon a good knowledge infrastructure within the university and within the academy. We're, we're building various tools of this, various parts of the ecology, but uh, we've got a ways to go with them, and we're working on it. And uh, we have kindly uh, received quite a bit of money from uh, National Science Foundation, 
uh, from Sloan Foundation and uh, from Microsoft as well, from their eScience group, uh, to do the work in this area. So uh, you wanted 35 minutes? I'm just at 35 minutes. Okay. <laughs>